So before we get started, let me give a little introduction of our two guests. Uh, we're lucky to have our interviewer, Christy, back for her third time interviewing. And we're so pleased to have her because she's an expert in the field. Um, she's a PhD student in information science with a concentration in linguistics. She also has a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science and a Master's of Science in Interdisciplinary Studies with a focus on computational linguistics. Um, her research focus is building computational tools for low resource languages and bias in machine learning. So thank you for joining us today, Christy. Happy to be here. Great. And then I want to introduce to you Melissa Robinson. Some of you may know her. Um, she is a UNT graduate of the Masters of Linguistics program, and she graduated in 2017. She's also a current student at, uh, in the Masters of Advanced Data Analytics program. I guess you can't get enough of UNT, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> and she currently works at Verilog as a researcher in linguistics, insights, and analytics. She's been at Verilog, a company that delves into the real world conversations and the real lived experience of healthcare stakeholders to give a holistic understanding of the human healthcare ecosystem since 2021. Before that, she worked as an academic counselor here at the College of Information and a linguistics annotator at Appen. Her skill set includes data analytics, linguistics, research, data annotation, and presentation. And welcome to you also, Melissa. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Yes. And so I recommend everybody that you put this in speaker view so that you can watch it like it's an interview. Um, imagine that we're all just sitting in an auditorium and they're on the sofa and we'll enjoy their conversation. I'm going to turn off my camera and put on my mic and you two just get started when you're ready. All right. Uh, first, uh, thank you, Lisa, for introducing everything. And uh, thank you, Melissa, for being here. Um, Melissa and I worked together in the past when she was a student here. So um, we've known each other for a while, but it's been a long time. Uh, Melissa, to get started, did you want to tell us a little bit about Verilog before we get into our first question? Yes, thank you so much for asking that. It, it can be a little bit complicated, um, so it's hard to boil down to one sentence. Um, but Verilog is a market research company um, specializing in healthcare market research, um, but it specifically is unique in that it uses linguistics to do market research. Um, there's not many companies out there like this. Additionally, we record conversations between doctors and patients, obviously with their knowledge. The doctors are responsible for doing the informed consent and talking it through with the patient and getting that actual consent, um, but they do the recording. And um, we analyze those conversations between doctors and patients. Typically our clients are pharmaceutical companies. Um, sometimes we have some, um, some clients outside um, such as universities, um, but for the most part, we work with pharmaceutical companies and um, they are really interested in how HCPs are discussing certain disease states or how they are presenting their treatment options to the patient, how the patients are responding to certain elements of that treatment. So that is the overall like of objectives from the clients. And we do that all through looking at the language that the doctors and the patients are using as well as the, um, the dynamic that happens between them. So we have a doctor and a patient, um, there's gonna be a power dynamic as well that needs to be you know, considered when looking at this. So that's basically the gist. We do different types of what we call deliverables or research. Some are a little bit more focused than others. For the most part, we do qualitative research, um, but we also do some quant level, um, we do some, um, some concordance work as well, depending on what the area of interest is as well. All right, um, then our first question. Um, so um, you, with your current position at Verilog, uh, how did you find that particular job, um, make the case for them to hire you and then leverage the education and work background that you have um, to get the job? Can you tell us a little bit about that process and, or maybe give us an example? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of first how I got the job, uh, I was applying to literally every linguistic position I could find. Um, market research was not an area that I thought, hey, this is a great place to apply my linguistics techniques and skills. Um, but luckily, this particular um, market research company 
really focuses on linguistics. So um, it just happened to come across my job feed um, and was one of the jobs that I applied for. And to be perfectly honest, when I applied for the job, I did not even know what the job was. Um, it was not 100% clear what I would be doing. And it took um, time and it took discussion with the company to fully understand what they would want us to, what they would want me to do in that position. Um, but really, honestly, I was applying to every position that I could possibly do and went through many, many interviews. Um, so this was not a, a fluke situation where, you know, this was not a situation where something just landed in my lap. This was me tenaciously going out there and looking for work to actually utilize my degree in linguistics. Um, so that is how, you know, I found this particular job. Um, in terms of making a case, it, it it helps that, you know, this is their their focus is they're wanting linguists. That's what they're wanting. Um, everybody I work with in my in the research department are linguists. So I'm working with other master's level or PhD level um, uh, researchers, all with linguistic background, very knowledgeable people. So they're wanting linguists. So I, I was lucky in that sense. So I didn't have to make a case that, hey, linguistics is is really what we need to do in this particular type of research. Um, however, in my per personal level, um, having a background in, ex in research was really what sold them. Um, I think if I had gone through graduate school and not done research um, and just did the coursework, didn't do conferences, didn't do papers, didn't didn't go beyond you know what was expected in the coursework i would not have landed this job um they were looking for someone with research experience and that is what i had i had i, I mean my research experience for the, was limited for the most part to my graduate experience but i had the experience i had the publications i had the the um conference presentations to back up the fact that I knew what I was doing. Um, additionally, there was interest in the type of research I did um, with my thesis in terms of I did work related to sentiment and that is important to the type of research that we look at um, in, in Verilog. So um, really those, those elements are really what made it possible to to land this job is having that research background. Um, did I miss anything else on that question? <laughs> I don't think you missed anything in the question, but I do okay. have sort of a, a follow up for you. So how how much research would you say you you participated in during your master's degree? How how many conferences did you go to that sort of thing to give the students an idea of like what? <sighs> I don't know an actual number. <laughs> um, I so uh, my research for my thesis developed over time, um, developed even before I started the actual thesis process. So I went through a lot of conferences at various stages of my thesis research, um, as well as so it, that alone. Um, oh my goodness, I can't even. I, I I would say a good handful of conferences. I did N Wave several times. I did lavender linguistics. Um, I've done uh, Linguistic Society of America. Um, those are the main ones I remember. I did some local ones as well. Um, but then I also worked um, as a research assistant mm -hmm. while I was in graduate school um, with Shobhana Chalya, and we did uh, language documentation. So I also had um, articles and um, posters and conference presentations related to that research as well. So don't think I can give you an actual number, um, but but yes, I did have, I tried to get as much experience as I could. Small, whether it, it's a poster, whether it's just attending a conference, um, I, I tried to get as much exposure to that as possible. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was looking for. Not really a specific number, but more, <laughs> you know. <laughs> All right. Um, so your title at Verilog is Researcher, Linguistic Insight and Analytics. So what does your day-to-day -day work look like? Um, can you tell us about maybe a project you've worked on or something like that? Yeah, so first day-to-day -day 
what does my day to day look like? It's a lot of things. Um, so one thing I wasn't, you know, that experienced with was um, project management. And now that's a huge part of my job. So I have, especially now that I am uh, working as research lead in certain projects, I have to plan out, you know, what stages things need to be accomplished in order to um, deliver the project on time. So I do a lot of project management, client meetings and emails. So there's a lot of what we call client management as well. Um, there is um, drafting up um, analytical uh, plans for the research. So the research questions, taking these kind of broad uh, client-based um, objectives and coming up with more specific research questions. Um, communicating with other researchers to help with that, that planning process. I also um, read through tons and tons and tons and tons of dialogues. Um, so uh, each project, we usually do about 40 to up to 70 dialogues um, for one project, and you will have multiple projects in one month. So every month is pretty much like finals week, is what I like to say. Um, you have a you have a deadline. You have to make that deadline, and you have to work toward that deadline. Um, so it's a lot of work to go through, and um, also probably one of the bigger important things is I have to research various different rare diseases or common diseases, and learn have at least a a, a good grasp of the basics of that disease. What, what is that? How does that impact the patient? What are the symptoms like? The types of treatments they'll, um, they'll have encounter um, so that I understand what's happening in the conversation. So there's also that little bit of research that's required on the medical side of things. Okay. And then did you have a project example? Yeah. So I, I have to be vague. I can't give like names. Of course. Um, but <laughs> Recently, um, I did a project that was very interesting on um, vaccines. Um, and so this one, is, the thing is when it comes to vaccine conversations is you might be interested in one particular vaccine, but the conversations happen with multiple vaccines involved. So it was a, um, so we looked at multiple vaccines, including flu and shingles and pneumonia and COVID came up, of course. Um, and What's interesting is when it comes to vaccine conversation or, or research, they're really interested in patient, patient hesitant, uh, hesitancy and then also the strength in which the doctor um, recommends a, a, uh, a vaccine. So a lot of our research is analyzing like, okay, is this a strong recommendation? Is this a weak recommendation? What makes it a strong recommendation? What types of lang what language are they using in terms to make a strong recommendation? So if they make it personal, I got this vaccine versus, you know, this vaccine is available, that strengthens the, the recommendation. If they use more personal language in general in terms of recommendation, many times doctors will say, um, it is recommended you get this vaccine versus I recommend you get to get this vaccine. So personal language does strengthen those recommendations. Um, so that's the type of work that we looked at in terms of how we look at language um, in a particular project. That's just a small glimpse. But, um, but in that case, you know, looking at sentiment and looking at, you know, the subtleties of the exchange between the patient and the doctor are important. Are, is the patient asking questions? Are they just back channeling? Are they um, saying anything of you know of a purpose to indicate whether they uh, whether they are actually planning on getting the vaccine or are they just trying to appease the doctor so they can get out of the, the doctor's office? So there's there's subtleties to the language as well. So you only have information about the conversation between the doctor and patient. You won't actually know if the patient ended up getting their vaccines or not. Correct. We don't have okay. that information. Um, it's one thing if they're getting it in the doctor's office at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times they tell them to go to the pharmacy to get it. So honestly, mm -hmm. the doctor probably doesn't even know if the patient got the vaccine. Yeah. In that case. That makes sense. All right. 
Um, our next question then, um, you have talked a little bit about uh, this dialogue-based research. So how is dialogue-based research different than other types of linguistic analysis? So honestly, it's really not. Um, it, it's really the reason why it's, we frequently say dialogue-based re research is that it is different within the realm of market research. This is unique to market research. Um, sometimes you'll see them as other market research companies talk about conversational um, research or dialogue research, but when they mean that, they're talking about a an interview with a patient or uh, or with a doctor. The difference is, you know, you sit down and you talk to the doctor. Okay, you have a patient who um, is resistant to get a vaccine. How do you handle that? What they say in that moment is could be completely different than what they actually do in the, in the doctor's office. So what makes us unique is that we have this natural data. And um, my company likes to use the term fly on the wall, that we can give you a fly on the wall perspective of what's actually happening in the, in the um, doctor's office. Now, in terms of linguistics, um, it's very similar to looking at like a discourse analysis, you know, any type of actual natural language. Um, and looking at those exchanges between two people. It's going to be slightly different um, types of research. It's going to be, as some people say, linguistic light, or, you know, we are doing this for a purpose, and that purpose is very specific to the client. And as much as I would love to go down a rabbit hole um, related to some really cool, interesting language related question I have in this one dialogue. Um, that's not going to be a value to my client. So ultimately, I have to remind myself of that. And that's really hard as a linguist because we get interested in those little language puzzles and we just want to focus on that and forget everything else. Um, we can't do that in this line of work. We have to remember what the client's um, objectives are and focus on those. I think you cut out for a second. I think we, oh, or maybe it was just me. I, yeah, can you hear me now though? Yes, no problem okay. now. Um, uh, I think I was going to ask then, uh, you've said you have multiple kinds of deliverables. So yes. what, what do you actually, can you give us an example of what a deliverable would be? Right, so what we call deliverables is basically the end product of whatever the research uh, product, uh, project is. So it's usually a PowerPoint, we usually do some type of readout or presentation of that report, um, but that report can be different things. So um, a popular one is what we call a, um, a discourse analysis study. This is where we'll have 40 to 70 dialogues that we need to analyze, and we do more of an analytical look um, to answer those particular client objectives. Um, but then sometimes, hey, uh, sometimes clients really love hearing the actual audio, hearing the, um, getting more of a, you know, in-depth look at particular, you know, problems or certain themes that they want to look at. And so in those situations, we can do what we call a listening session. In these situations, we do less on the analytical side, but we highlight important elements within the dialogue. Um, so we'll we'll focus in on, let's say, five dialogues, and the client will actually be able to listen. We'll highlight some interesting elements within the dialogue. We get a conversation started with the client. Um, and then there's more on the quant side where we um, are able to do larger um, amounts of data. Um, and look at, you know, more related to the types of patients that are doing, you know, the certain behaviors. So, for example, again, going to the vaccine example, um, what types of patients are having these conversations about the flu vaccine? Um, those are less likely to happen. We don't do those as often, um, but they may be happening more. Um, we're getting some, uh, we're, we're combining with another company and are gonna be having some data sciences that are coming in um, that um, hopefully we'll be able to kind of combine some of this, um, some of the work that we do with them. Um, 
but but right now you know it's it's those are those are just like an overview of the main types of deliverables. There's still other ones that sure. we do, um, but that's what I mean when I say deliverable is that basically the end result or the report, basically. Okay. Um, so you've you've obviously had a lot of skills that you developed both during your master's degree and then um, now that you have on the job. So what kind of skills do you feel like you came in with and what do you feel like you've learned as you've gone along? Yeah, um, basic data annotation, um, manage data management, um, being able to, you know, just just basic linguistic skills that I've been able to hone into specifically what what is important to the client. Um, so sometimes we have to push, you know, move away from what you know we want to do within linguistics, but. Um, like I said, looking at things with looking at the semantics, looking at sometimes it's about the pause, you know, sometimes it's about the questions that aren't being asked. Um, those skills that I gained, you know, studying uh, at UNT, um, studying linguistics, studying discourse analysis, um, I feel like I came into uh, with that. Um, also, presentation skills. Um, I was never a natural um, person to be up front. That's, I never wanted to be up front. That's never been something I desired to be in the spotlight. Uh, but graduate school really kind of forced me to do that, um, especially not only in class, but going into these conference presentations. And really that has served me very well. Um, I am constantly having to do presentations to um, highly knowledgeable people within the medical field <laughs> about medical topics. So it, it has allowed me to be a strong presenter, and which is necessary for the job that I have. Uh, skills that I didn't have, um, really the, the medical side of things was yeah. lacking, uh, which is understandable. I don't have a background in um, medicine in any way, shape or form. Um, but it's also been some of the more interesting things, because if you're putting yourself in the patient's shoes, you're, the patient's only going to know so much about the disease that they have. And sometimes it's really about how is the doctor communicating um, information to the patient? Are they communicating in a way that the patient's going to understand? Um, so I think there's some benefits to possibly not coming from a ba medical background. But I've had to learn also to do a lot of research related to, as I go, related to various different diseases that I um, have to do research on. So um, also just like interacting on a business level, I would say was is a skill that I've learned. Moving from academia to a business world has been very different. Um, they, they, things are just handled differently. Um, interactions are different. Um, the focus is very different. And um, it's hard to explain, but that that transition to the business world has been um, has been kind of um, a, an uphill battle. Um, so I would say that was something I've had to learn outside of graduate school as well. Uh, was that challenging learning to navigate the business world or <laughs> it definitely was it definitely was some of it positive some of it negative um but for the most part um you're also around in my job you're also around a lot of people that come from academia so you also have resources <laughs> for when th certain things don't make sense um so so it was challenging i'm still like there's still certain things that feel um unnatural is the best way to say um, but I'm, I've got a grasp for it now, and I understand how it works to to a certain degree, at least. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it looks like um, you're also getting another master's degree at UNT. So um, that's an MS in advanced data analytics. So mm -hmm. why did you start that program? And what have you learned from that that's helping with your job? Yeah, so... Uh, currently, I'm not taking courses in it. I'm still hoping to go back and finish it up. Um, but I started um, taking, I started that program 
Um, when I was at UNT um, as an academic counselor, I was um, I was working as an advisor for linguistics, for data science, and then later for the advanced data analytics program. And I really, one thing that is like the common theme throughout is a passion for data and the power of data. And I really, really wanted to learn more about how to how to use that data to do the things that I wanted to do, whether it was research, whether it was um, to just understand things. And so that was the main focus. Um, I've taken a few courses. I was originally planning on doing um, computational linguistics and um, decided that I, I would be able to um, learn a lot of the skills that I could without taking additional linguistics courses um, by going through advanced data analytics. Um, so I've taken machine learning courses. Um, they have an NLP course. Um, and just to kind of give you a background, I've also taken some of these, you know, taken computational linguistics during my linguistics uh, degree. And so I had the linguistic part. I wanted the data analytics and the and the, the the data side that I didn't have the skills that I didn't have, and so that's really why I went into the degree. And I think it would still be valuable in the career that I uh, that I've decided to go into. Um, so my hope is to go back and finish up the coursework in that. Okay. Um, how do linguistics and analytics work together in your role at Verilog? Uh, let's see, I feel like I covered some of this already. Um, so I do yeah, I do a lot of uh, data management. We have um, we have uh, a huge database of conversations um, that we comb through on a regular basis. Um, we have to navigate a lot of data points for various different conversations, not only it, so it's not just like, I want you to research diabetes. Um, it's a very specific patient type they're wanting. It's a very specific um, doctor they're wanting. It's a very specific um, a point in their disease state that they're wanting. So there's a lot of data points that we deal with on a day-to-day -day uh, day -day, um, um, challenge when it comes to those research projects. And so being able to navigate and do the analytics as well as the linguistics is super important because um, you have to be able to, to navigate and, in, and know what is gonna be problematic in terms of the data and problematic in terms of the research before you even get to the data. Um, because you will have those, those traps where a client has a very specific type of disease they're wanting, a very specific type of patient, a very specific, and and if you don't realize those traps before the project starts, <laughs> it will bite you in the butt later on. Um, so I, I really do think it it's kind of a marriage be, um, in terms of that analytic side, being able to manage the, the, um, the elements of the research objectives and from the client and then also communicate them in a, in a linguistic way so that we can look at it through a linguistic lens if that answers the question are there technologies that you're using for your analytics that you feel like uh, it would be helpful for students to know about or to learn a little about so we do have some analytics that are within the database that we use um, so when we set up a sample it will automatically give us um, you know, the breakdown across that sample. Um, I use, a, personally, I use a lot of Excel. Yeah. Um, there are other aspects we, in terms of like when we do uh, like uh, concordance work, we have used a program called uh, Wordsmith that, uh, that also will break down more on a quant level. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of it. 
Um, but that is a program that we've used. Um, we've looked at a lot of different programs. I don't do too much. We also do social media related projects. Um, I don't do too much with the social media projects, um, but they use Brand Watch um, for that particular, um, th that type of research. Um, so everything is kind of specific to what we're doing, I guess. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. Um... Let's see. Um, we've talked about this a little bit. Um, so what areas of linguistics do you use in your current role? Yeah, so um, the main two areas that, that it, at a company level, there are of interest are sociolinguistics and of course, discourse analysis, because we're really analyzing that, um, the interaction between the, uh, the two individuals and um, more specifically, like I said, I my er, one of my areas of interest is semantics. I, I um, so I would say also semantics um, is a great one to look at it. Um, I look at sentiment quite frequently. Again, this is not a, we're not at a level where we can do sentiment analysis necessarily, um, but I do you know take sentiment in consideration when looking at this data as well. Okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what your uh, what about your position at Appen doing data data annotation? Um, what did you learn from that, and um, what skills did you maybe learn in school that helped you with that? Yeah, so I there's actually I think two different companies. I worked at Appen. I think the other one is called Lion Bridge. Um, I've never worked at that one, so I can't tell you too much about it. But they're very similar. Um, they're like uh, contract based. Um, part-time work that you can do even while you're in graduate school um, and they have specifically they do some other things like social media like searching that anybody can do um, but they have a specific section of projects that are specific to linguistic students and um, you can uh, you can sign up for these projects it's fairly uh, straightforward I did um, annotation, data annotation for natural language generation, um, as well as natural language understanding. Um, so basically tagging the data so that um, that they could use it for these bigger projects. So I would tag it for like, okay, this is a location. So I tag this particular part of the sentence of location. Um, I would also, so like one of the projects I worked on, it sounded like they were trying to build something along the lines of like a Siri kind of setup. And so they did a lot of stuff about like the weather or um, directions or things like that. And so um, it's really, that's straightforward. What you do um, is just hanging the data according to their guidelines that they give you. You can also, sometimes they ask you to um, draft sentences. Um, in as many complicated um, ways as you might think up. Um, so passive voice, active voice, any possible way that you can say the same thing in multiple ways. Um, so it's fairly easy work in sense of what they're asking you to do. I think it's very valuable to do because for a couple of reasons, you need to know if you're, if you're interested in getting into research, you need to know that you can stare at the data for hours and do the same thing over and over and over. Um, it, it can be challenging. We might love the idea of research, but um, it can be tedious at times. And here I'm doing research 40 to 60 hours a week. I'm looking at data all the time. It can be, um, it can be a lot. So, um, having just that exposure to data annotation, to working with language, to working with data, even at a small scale like that, I think looks really good on your resume to let them know, hey, I can do research, I can, I can do annotation, I can do linguistic work outside of graduate school. Um, so basically, that's, that's kind of what I did uh, when I was there. And uh, what were the qualifications for doing something like that? You said they take students? Yeah, I was in graduate school when I um, when I 
uh, did it. I don't know in terms of bachelor's students if if you have to have a bachelor's degree. I think it depends on the project. Um, but I definitely encourage you, even if you're still in getting your bachelor's, to go and look because there might be some projects that you can do while you're still working on your bachelor's degree. That's really cool. All right. Um, uh, from 2016 to 2018, you worked on an NSF funded project. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, what the project focused on, what you learned from that work? Yeah, so um, this was uh, the research project when I was a research um, assistant in graduate school. I uh, worked for uh, Dr. Shovana Chalia, um, and we were um, working on documenting the the uh, language Lam Kong. Hi, hi, Sum Shut, I see you in the audience. Um, <laughs> I also worked with Sum Shut quite a bit while I was doing that. Um, so we were we were documenting the language. I the way it came about was I was taking um, phonology um, from Shobana and really found it interesting. But I really was curious what phonology would be like with real data, because in class you get these fun little puzzles. They're nice, neat data. You know, there's always an answer. You always solve it. And so I. Um, asked Shobana, like, I'm interested in, in kind of exploring this in, with real data. And she invited me to sit in on a few research meetings um, and kind of volunteer at first. Um, and so I did that. Um, and then eventually she hired me on as one of her research assistants. And um, I actually did acoustic phonetics and worked in prop. That was my particular area. Um, and we actually, I think this is, might be one of the questions that come later, but we actually went to India at one point. Um, I also did data collection. I wrote up guidelines for that data collection, um, wrote up manuals for how to go about that, um, inventory and equipment. I did pretty much everything, um, every type of thing in, in terms of like that data collections um, element of it. Um, we did a few posters and chapters and articles related to that particular research as well. But it taught me quite a bit. Um, it gave me a lot of research skills, um, especially um, collaborating and working with other, um, other people on a research team, which is hugely important in my current position as well as writing together academically. Um, while we're not doing academic writing necessarily now, we do have to collaborate and we have to write a final report basically together. So a lot of those same skills um, I use today. Okay, yeah, so uh, I was actually going to ask about your trip to India next. So you can tell me uh, a little bit about maybe how that came about and what you did there. Yeah, so um, my goodness, I can't remember what year it was. Um, but Shobana planned a trip, um, and I think there's been several trips since then, but I only went one year, um, and we went to Hyderabad. Um, there was a group of young um, Lam Kong speakers that were living in Hyderabad at the time, and so we went there to collect data um, from those speakers. Um, and so um, that's, like I said, that's where I, I in, in preparation for that, I um, wrote up a lot of guides um, and manuals for that whole collection process, not only for making sure that we were collecting the data appropriately and not trying to influence or, you know, make the data, you know, a certain way, but also making sure we didn't lose any equipment, making sure we didn't lose any um, data, um, how to name the data, the metadata that comes along with it. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Um, we did all sorts of things. I'm trying to remember, we, um, we had like natural uh, storytelling that was done as well as pronunciation of list of words. So we, we, we did various different types of uh, data collection for that. Can you tell us what your favorite thing on the trip was? Like what your oh favorite thing you did was or? I got to see the, the beginning of the monsoon uh, season in uh, Hyderabad before we left. It was nice to see it 
briefly and then leave. <laughs> but that was amazing. I mean, the food was amazing. I, I had so much fun when I was in India. Um, it was a, it was a lot of fun. Good. Yeah. All right. Um, when you were in the linguistics program, uh, you work, also worked on the uh, TESOL graduate academic certificate. Um, did you originally think that you would teach ESL? Uh, sorry, ESL. Um, have you ever taught ESL classes? And then um, do any of the skills that you learned in those courses cross over into what you do today? Yeah. So I. So a little bit about uh, about me and how I got into this program to start with. Um, I do not have a background in linguistics. I, my master, I mean, my, my bachelor's is in English. Um, I hadn't taken any linguistic courses before I started the program. And um, I had taught or worked in an ESL program um, before I joined UNT. And I, I also have experience teaching high school English. So I thought um, I would be, I thought it would be a good path for me to teach ESL. Um, so that is actually the major that I started with when I joined the program. I started out as an ESL major um, and took the first introduction course. Um, if you're a master's student and you don't have a bachelor's in uh, linguistics, you know what course I'm talking about. Um, it is kind of a crash course to linguistics. And the first thing you learn is phonetics. And I remember looking at all these symbols and thinking, what did I get myself into? Um, but I absolutely became obsessed with it um, and fell in love with linguistics um, as a, you know, linguistics as a science in that course. That's really what kicked off my passion. And I'm pretty sure it was the first semester. I don't even think I finished the first semester and I switched my major from ESL to linguistics um, and just knew that that is what I wanted to pursue. I um, kept on my, my TESOL certificate though, uh, because I was also taking uh, ESL courses. I still enjoyed it. Um, I, I enjoyed the courses that I took. Um, I, I don't know that I can say that I use, utilize those particular skills. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but I do enjoy the, the courses that I took. I always love teaching. I love explaining and and trying to reach that level of understanding with another person. Um, so anything related to education is always of value to me. So um, I definitely I definitely value that that experience that I had getting that TESOL certificate as well. Um, do you do you miss the the education aspect now that you've moved into more corporate work? Um, in some ways, and you know, like that that was part of the the challenge is like I said, moving from the higher education into the business world was kind of a culture shock and still is. Um, but in some ways, I still get to discuss my research. I still get to have those moments, and it's not I'm not going to say I'm teaching my clients necessarily. But I still have those moments, and I can still have those conversations um, with people. So I, I, part of me, yes, I'll say yes to some degree. I miss it, but really, I don't. I, I do um, enjoy being able to research, and um, this really allows me to do that. So, okay. No, oh, there's Lisa. <laughs> Are we ready for questions, Lisa? Yes, I think we were ready for some questions, but I've really enjoyed this conversation between you and Melissa. You're exactly the right person to ask her these questions. And I, I learned a lot about what you do, Melissa, and I love your deep, deep explanations. Um, there was a question that, that went to one of our colleagues about the company that you worked at that took projects. And I believe that was Appen, right? Mm -hmm, A-P-P-E-N. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not sure about their company logo. Do you know how it looks? Because there might be more if they want to search it online, you know. Yeah, I would search both uh, Appen and uh, Lion, Lion Bridge. Bridge. Um, I did not work for Lion Bridge, um, but that is another company that does pretty much the same one, the same type of work. Um, it looks like we have an, a link in there. Um, yes. But there should be, if, whenever you get on there, there should be a place where you can search different projects. 
And there should be a specific area that says linguistics, at least that's what it looked like when I went there many years ago. Um, um, but that you sh it should be clear when you find the right app. And I didn't realize there was more than one, so. Okay, and then I'm gonna just start from the beginning of the questions that popped into the chat. There are several. Um, so first of, first of all, Sarah asks, um, do you have any advice on how to generate commercial interest in other branches of linguistic research besides computational linguistics? For example, language preservation, which is something that you, you did some language documentation work. Mm -hmm. So any ideas? Oh, that's tough. And so I'm assuming um, like funding is, or are you talking about? Um... She says commercial interest. So yeah. perhaps not grants, you know? Right. So I'm trying to think if I see if I can fully understand the question. Um, one thing I will say, and this may not fully answer your question, so I apologize. Um, one recommendation I will make is look is creating a LinkedIn profile. I know this sounds very silly. I was one of those people that in graduate school had no interest in LinkedIn. Um, and embarrassingly, even though I've been out of school for a while, I just recently, like a year or so back, made my first profile. But there are so many resources out there and there are so many um, um, nonprofits that you can look into um, related that you can research through LinkedIn in terms of what jobs are available. Um, this is a huge way to find what types of you know, commercial or, or corporation based companies might be interested in linguistics. Um, it, it, otherwise I would never have found Verilog. This is how I found Verilog. Um, in terms of language documentation, I'm not 100% sure, but I would definitely look to see if there's maybe some nonprofit options. Mm -hmm. um, for looking at language uh, documentation and preservation. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, you're uh, not alone. Can I? Uh, hi, Lisa. Sorry. Uh, thank you so much for your time and for the answer. Uh, no, I maybe I didn't word my. Oh, this is Sarah. This is Sarah with yes. a follow up. What I wanted to know basically is how to how to commercial profit at the same time as we do language documentation so that we can kind of do both. And uh, yes, it was more oriented in terms of grant applications because I know that Compling uh, uh, is probably one of the most sought after areas mm -hmm. of linguistics, but... Uh, so Sarah, you're kind of cutting out. Why don't we stop there and let Melissa see if she has anything yeah, to follow up? I, I think I got a, a basic understanding Sarah, um, I'm, I don't know that I have the best answers for you. Unfortunately, I think when it comes to comp lane, it's gonna be the hot topic. It's gonna to be the things that corporations and, and commercial you know, entities are gonna be interested in. Um, I wish it was the case that, that they could see a commercially viable to fund um, you know, language preservation in the same way, um, but I don't know that it's necessarily something that it, that on a commercial level they, that there would be an interest in funding. Um, I could be wrong with that. I don't have much experience. There are definitely grants out there though um, for language um, preservation. Um, and like I said, nonprofits as well. I, I Unfortunately, I think for the most part when it comes to language preservation, it's gonna be on the nonprofit level and grant level. Um, but I would definitely talk to somebody within that field um, who can give you a better answer for that. Okay, thank you, Melissa. And then Blake also has a question if you want to unmute and ask your question, Blake. Hi, sorry about that. Just took me a second to get that unmute to work. Um, I uh, have worked as a medical translator and I'm doing medical translation technology research is what I'm focused on. Mm -hmm. um, and have been for a long time. Has, does your company specifically just work um, in English or are you working on adding multiple languages to it? So we do do some international work as well. I personally have not worked with these uh, the, on these projects. 
Um, but occasionally we do, um, especially on the uh, European side. So we have linguists who um, are very fluent or native level in Italian, German, French for those types of projects, um, as well as trans and uh, as well as be able to translate um, those conversations um, so that they work with one of our our American uh, linguists as well to complete those deliverables. Oh, interesting. Okay. But yeah, it, it, it sounds like it might be something that you should keep on your radar. Um, it kind of aligns with your interests. Um, I know, I don't know the process, but they also um, have, you know, transcribers um, as well for all the data that comes in. I speak a very obscure language set, so probably not on the radar of the top <laughs> most profitable ones for you, but uh, it was just an interesting idea, just something I was thinking of. I yeah. um, wondered if your company is, was involved in anything like that. Yeah, well, if you know a pharmaceutical co company is interested in that particular language, um, we'll, you know, we might do it. <laughs> Sounds good. Appreciate it. Thanks, Blake. And I see that Kinza has a question, but before I move on to your question, Kinza, I just want to point out that um, Chris, uh, sorry, Melissa mentioned a few important things. She mentioned LinkedIn, and we do have a UNT College of Information Community LinkedIn page where we do post openings when we find them. For example, um, Sandy put a link in the chat that Appen is hiring, and I think we've even posted that on there. And a while back, Melissa had posted that Verilog was hiring. Didn't you, Melissa, like yes. maybe six months ago or something? Yeah. And, and so we I also took that and gave it to um, Sandy and Sandy got it posted on our LinkedIn page. So if you're interested in seeing any time linguistics jobs open up, they, when we know about them, they'll always be posted. And if Melissa knows about them, I'm going to know about them because I follow her on LinkedIn. <laughs> and I was also new to LinkedIn when I took this job. Um, 23 years as a teacher, I didn't think I needed a LinkedIn page. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, let's go to Kinza's question. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question, Kinza. Hello there. Thank you so much for this wonderful um, session. I really enjoyed it. And I came to know about so many new aspects and approaches of language documentation. And I, I like this combination, how information science and linguistics can deal with healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. I have uh, something that I am really interested in, and uh, I, I believe now I, I can attempt it. So, um, um, uh, Malisha, I am from uh, uh, Balochistan. This mm -hmm. is an underdeveloped uh, region of Pakistan. Uh, in my hometown, women uh, go to the to the landscape and women gather indigenous herbs mm -hmm. and then they know the recipe and they make it and they they don't go to to the doctors they don't mm -hmm. have many facilities so this is how they survive and cure themselves they have medicine for children uh, pregnant women men mm -hmm. animals everything now the thing is because languages so those languages are endangered so it means that information that had it yeah. did related to medical science is also vulnerable and we have flood and other things so i i really want to um the um, you know gather that information and preserve it make digital mm -hmm. archives and um the the herbs sorry, herbs, um, we can make pictures, something like that can be done because now we have these, you know, digital resources. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to have uh, your opinion about it. Um, what do you think about it? There is a little, um, a few research documents where people have talked about women's role uh, mm -hmm. uh, for, for the preservation of those things. So they say, okay, woman is the custodian of that culture. A little bit um, have been discussed, but it would be really great if um, you know a good study is conducted and right. So that that's very interesting, and I'm glad you brought it up, uh, Sumshut. I hope you don't mind me throwing you under the bus a little bit here. Um, if I remember right, Sumshut and Shobana were doing something similar um, okay. with um, traditional medicines and plants that are used. Um, I believe they took photos um, to also document the plants as well. 
Um, as and so um, I would, if you don't know Sumshut, she's in the chat. I strongly I recommend know. reach out to her. Um, she might have some good ideas of how they went about, like, pres you know, preserving these traditional methods of medication, um, as well as the language that comes with it. Um, I think it's very valuable and very interesting. Um, and I, you know, I will tell you, medical linguistics was not an area of interest of mine until I got this job. But now I feel like it's something that I will always want to be um, researching because there's there's so much that comes with that there's a vulnerability that comes with with health and and the language and the dynamics that come with somebody who is sick. Um, and then you add on the aspect of traditional medicine, you have this element of, of culture as well um, that, and that this need to be preserved. So definitely I would recommend, um, I don't know if Sumshut still has access to all of that, um, but she would be a good starting place um, okay. in terms of we're... method. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I no didn't problem. know that. I can talk to Sumshad about it, but now I will <laughs> hopefully, hopefully she does not mind me throwing her under the bus there. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, and it looks like nobody has dropped another question in the chat just yet, but I do have a question of my own, if you don't mind. Uh, we still have about three minutes left. And of course we have some professors here on the call as well. If any of the professors wanna say hello to Melissa, or bring up any questions about what she's been doing lately. I don't know, invite her over for dinner. <laughs> um, so I know that uh, you wrote you you wrote and defended your thesis while in the program, right? Mm -hmm. While you yeah. were here in our program. And then, so that is not an option that I took. I took the non-thesis option. And now that everything that you're saying, I'm thinking, oh, I should have done a thesis. But it was a little different back then. And I just wanted to teach. But what was your experience like doing the research and writing the thesis and what kind of support did you get from the faculty? Yes. Oh my goodness. So my thesis uh, chair is in the chat, I believe. Hi, Trisha. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, it was, it was a very intense experience. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I started working on the idea of, of for my thesis project and working on, you know, preliminary research earlier on in my program. Um, and despite that, despite having worked on it early, when I actually started taking thesis hours, it, it took me longer than I thought it would take me. It was, it was, a, it was a, a challenge. And, um, but I learned a lot. Um, one thing that I have to deal with quite frequently with my job now, um, that, <laughs> I um, got exposure to, especially with during the thesis stage, is having a lot of eyes and um, voices in different directions that you can go with your research, as well as the writing. Um, it was um, it was it, it I get a lot of critique now on my writing, and it can be it can be very personal. And it's hard sometimes not to take it personally, um, but it's also a way to get you to a better place, to make things accessible and understandable to more people. And so it's important to go through those experiences to improve as a, as in your own skill set, but then also to, you know, be able to encounter those experiences in the future, because I have this on a daily basis now. Um, and then, of course, just the research experience that I gained with that, um, with that overall research in the many different methods that I that I used in, in that thesis was was hugely helpful. Excellent. And I hear you saying again and again that some of that the advice that students could take away from this is that they should be doing research, looking for opportunities to do research, reaching out to their professors and faculty advisors Absolutely. and saying, what are you doing? And could I help? And even if it's not paid at first, it's not a research uh, position, they can start doing volunteer work and that can turn into something later at graduate yeah, research. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say um, making connections with your professors outside of class is probably the one of the biggest um, things I can recommend to students um, and look for those opportunities and take those opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, 
I got where I, I got basically by having um, those connections with my professors. I developed um, really strong connections with many professors. And I remember Trisha saying many times, um, really encouraging us to research and to go to conferences and present. That was really, really emphasized to us. And I saw a lot of my, my fellow students not doing that. And I remember early on going, okay, well, I know I need to do this, but how? I was, there was a lot of, there was like, how do I even start kind of situation? And those connections and those uh, and the the mentoring you get from your professors are really a starting point, um, as well as getting those opportunities. Great, and you brought up the word mentor, so I just want to say again, thank you for being a mentor to one of our linguistic students right now. I can see that here in the room we have some of our other mentors and mentees joining us, and I'm so happy that we have this program and other programs within the you know several different departments that provide this mentorship both faculty as a student, student to student, alumni to student. And we have come to the top of the hour. I could probably sit here all day listening to you, but you might have some research projects to work on. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanna thank Christy for being an excellent interviewer as always. And I wanna thank Melissa for your time today and for sharing your experience with us. It's been invaluable. And I wanna thank all the guests also for coming.